Happy Sabbath. We've got a small gang here today while everyone else is uh, at Clarkson, which means that uh, you guys get to uh, enjoy a sermon I'm really excited to preach, and nobody else does. It's for us. Actually, it'll be online later this afternoon, so anyone else can catch up. But it's good to see you guys. It's an exciting day today. Um, let me just open my notes here before, before I get going and lose my place. Yeah, it's a, an exciting day today. Uh, because not only is it, is it sunny, and not only is the cold finished, we are done with the cold. Amen, right? Hallelujah. That's, I mean, that's enough reason to just praise. Woo, hallelujah. The cold is finished. Uh, I, loved, I didn't like the news that was warning about all the fires. Did you guys see that? It rains so much. There's so much vegetation. When it dries up, we're more likely to get fires. It's like, well, that's ironic. Um, but yeah, really, really excited to be here. Um, but it's not only the great weather that I'm excited about. As uh, Ebenezer mentioned at 3.30 this afternoon at Clarkson Church, we're going to have two baptisms, Chelsea and Liam. And we're really, really excited, uh, excited for that. And you're all invited to come along and, and celebrate this new chapter of their lives and their faith. Uh, so I want to I preach a short message this morning that uh, a theme that I actually really, really love, really, really love in the Bible. But I want to introduce it by telling you guys about one of my childhood frustrations. See, back when I was a kid, there was a movie that I always wanted to see, and my parents would never let me. The name of the movie... Let me see if I can get this working. Was RoboCop. <laughs> you know what? I don't know how old I must have been, eh, six or seven. What, what, what young boy doesn't want to watch a half-human, half-robot cop, right? The premise of the movie, I, I never really got to see the movie. Um, I always wanted to see it, but never really got around to it. But the film, it was obviously science fiction, with its main character having a human body and a robotic body fused together to create something that was human, but more. And of course, it made him bulletproof and super strong and all these super cool things, right? So if evolution was your worldview, RoboCop sort of represented the next step. A human who was more than human, better than human, a blend of man and machine, a cyborg. Now, even though I wanted to see this movie really badly, like I said, I never even got a chance. To this day, I haven't seen a single one of them. Yeah, I still, still haven't seen them. They even made a new one in 2014. Didn't see it either. But here's the thing. Um, chances are I won't need to because according to the news, RoboCop may soon move from science fiction to reality. Back in 2018, The Guardian published this article, and this is not the only one, there are so many of them. The title of the article, No Death and an Enhanced Life is the Future Transhuman. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term transhumanism, not to be confused with transsexuality, that's a completely different topic. Transsexuality is when you have a person in a biological male or biological female body that identifies with the opposite gender. That's a different issue. Transhumanism is about a movement of scientists and philosophers who are aiming to push man beyond our biological state into a cybernetic state. And when they do this, they will transcend the human limitations, hence the term transhumanism. So in this article, um, oh, by the way, I, I think I have just another, another little image here that might actually help make sense of what I just said. I think it's this next one here. Yeah, there it is. So transcending our humanness, that's the idea. They want to take control of the process of evolution through technology to push us into the next stage. And this isn't some, you know, wackos off in the side somewhere. This is very mainstream, very academic, very, very scientific, a lot of philosophers involved in this, in this movement. So the article quoted um, one, of the, one of the brains behind the transhuman movement, the, the Guardian article, and he said this, we can and we should eradicate, eradicate sorry, 
aging as a cause of death. So in the transhuman movement, they see aging as a disease that can be cured. We can eradicate aging as a cause of death. We can and should use technology to augment our bodies and our minds. I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink. It's this computer chip you implant in the brain. It unites your brain with artificial intelligence to make you smarter. Uh, we can and should merge with machines, remaking ourselves finally in the image of our own higher ideals. Once again, the goal of the transhumanist movement is to take control of the process of evolution through technology and usher humanity into its next stage of development in which aging and death no longer control us. Because biotechnical enhancements have enabled us to become human, but more. In some circles of the transhuman world, they're even talking about the capacity, developing the technology to digitize a person's consciousness, a person's mind, so that when the body dies, the person can be resurrected in a machine, in a cloud. Topics that once belonged squarely in the realm of religion, things like immortality or even resurrection, have entered the secular conversation. They want to make us human, but more. Now, there's a lot that I can say about the transhuman movement, and it goes by different terms. Transhumanism, posthumanism, humanity plus, humanity 2.0. But I'm not really here to talk about blending man with machine. Because the Bible actually introduces us to something better. There is such a thing, if, if I may use this as a metaphor, as biblical transhumanism. Now, don't freak out. I'll explain what I mean by that. Because rather than the union of man with machine, the Bible teaches the fusion of man with divinity. What Paul refers to as being partakers of the divine nature. So, I want to explore that really quickly here this morning. Come, come with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's take a look at this better vision that the Bible offers us for our humanity. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, I'm going to start from verse 45. I'll have them on the screen, and then we'll break them down a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. If you're there, say, I'm there. You're not there. I'll wait a little longer. <laughs> and then we'll say a prayer, and, and we'll, we'll dig into the text. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and for the chance that we have to come together and worship you and open the Bible and hear your voice and learn more about you. I pray that as we explore this theme in Scripture that you would open our eyes to the beauty and the depth of who you are and what your ideal is for your children. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put it here on the slide. It says this, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and after the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. There is a lot happening in those three verses. So much. I don't, I'm not going to get to cover all of it, but let me try and do a simple breakdown to at least map out what Paul is saying here. First of all, Paul makes a distinction between two atoms. There is a first atom and there is a second atom. And in the text, he defines who the first atom is and he defines who the second atom is. The first atom, he says, became a living being. 
But the second atom, oh, well, actually, let me just go ahead and I, didn't, I, I mapped it out, so we'll just look at the first atom. So let's focus on that. He became a living being. He's of the dust of the earth. As is he, this first atom, an earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. That's humanity, right? Us. We have borne the image of this earthly man. He's human. He's dust. But then he explores the second atom, who he says the second atom was a life-giving spirit. So it's really obvious who the first atom is, right? We're talking about Adam. I mean, it's pretty obvious. The second Adam, he never fully names, but it becomes clear as you read through it. He's talking about Jesus. He's a life-giving spirit. He came from heaven. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And we will bear the image of the heavenly man. He's talking about the believers. He's human, but he's more. Dust and spirit. He came into the earth in human flesh, but there was something about him that was more than human. He was human, but more. So what is Paul talking about in these texts? He's, he's, he's sharing something that is absolutely profound and mind-blowing. And I don't have time to explore all the implications of it. But what he's saying is every single human being born in this world is born as a descendant of that first Adam. And that first Adam became a living being, and he's from the dust of the earth. And, and as he was, so are we. Because we are descendants of the first Adam. We have borne his image, human, dust. And more to the point, he's fallen. He's sinful. And so we all bear his image. We are all descendants of our ancestor, Adam. But then, into the human story, enters a new Adam, and the whole idea, the, the very reason why Paul even calls Jesus a new Adam is because he's bringing an implication here. Adam is the head of humanity. Adam is the ancestor. He's the father of the human race. But now there's a new Adam. There's a new head of a new humanity. Jesus is replacing our ancestor. Jesus is replacing Adam. He is becoming the father of a whole new humanity. He's a life-giving spirit. He's of heaven. And as is the heavenly, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we bore the image of the first Adam, the fallen Adam, so we will bear the image of the heavenly Adam, the new Adam, a new kind of human, human but more, dust and spirit. So there's this theme throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament, that in Jesus... There is a whole new humanity. He becomes the father of a whole new species. And that when we give our lives to Jesus, we are adopted out of the family of the first Adam into the family of the second Adam. And that when we are adopted out of the family of the first Adam into the family of the second Adam, everything we were under the first Adam is erased. And we now take on the legacy of the new Adam, the second Adam. But here's the crazy thing. The second Adam is human, but he is also divine. And so now we begin to see this theme throughout Scripture. For example, let me just quote a few verses here. We begin to see this theme throughout the New Testament. Whoops, I turned off the screen. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit in him. And we read in Galatians 3, 27. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
There's a sense in which you're human, but there's something new taking place. There's, there's something more emerging in your experience. When you give your life to Jesus, you move from a descendant of the first Adam with all of its limitations into this new humanity where you become one with Christ. And I love how Peter defines it in 2 Peter chapter 1, 3-4. to He puts it this way. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Filled with God's spirit, something new is taking place. See, biblical transhumanism, if we can use that as a metaphor, isn't about blending a human with a machine in order to reach some next stage of evolution, but about blending or uniting man with divinity so that we can be filled with the Spirit of God to live in harmony with God's ideal for humanity. And so what this means is that when we give our lives to Jesus, when we invite God into our lives, the Bible tells us that we're filled with his spirit and our humanity is united to his divinity and we become a new kind of human, a new creation filled with his spirit. Now, I, I often have to stop and ask myself, what would happen if we really believe that? What would change in our life right now if we really believed that as believers in Jesus, we are not simply humans, ancestors, or descendants of the first Adam, but that we are united with God through Christ as descendants of the second Adam? What walls would come down? What limitations would disappear if we really believe that in Jesus, we have become members of a new humanity that is united with God's spirit. I love how Ellen White puts this in Desire of Ages, page 123. She says, Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. That's crazy. That's wild. I'm not even sure I've fully grasped how incredible that is. So I'd say this, even though Chelsea is not here, but Liam is. Hi, Liam. <laughs> and maybe Chelsea will watch this later on online. But I'd say this to our baptismal candidates as you commit your lives to Jesus today. The Bible promises that you will be filled with his spirit. That you are no longer a child of earth's Adam. But you have been adopted out of that family into a new humanity you are now a child of heaven's Adam, a child of Christ. No longer of the family of earth, you are of the family of heaven. No longer who you once were, you are now a new creation. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We were buried with him by baptism into death. Think about that. We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. A new life, a new humanity, a new creation, human but more. So I would say to the transhuman project, there's something to be admired in the technological advancements that are taking place there. 
But according to the Bible, there's something better. Humanity united with divinity. And it's free in Jesus. Father, as we look at the world around us and we ponder the things that are taking place, we can see how humanity oftentimes is desperately trying to create counterfeits or alternatives to what you already offer. So many in the world today, scholars, academics, even politicians, are fully immersed in this transhuman goal, failing to recognize that the goals that they're aiming for, overcoming death and overcoming disease and all of those things, you, you've already accomplished that. That's already ours in Jesus. And that in Jesus, there is this promise that when we walk with him, our humanity is united to your divinity. Our weakness is united to your strength. And we want that experience, Lord. We want the experience of not merely walking the earth as children of Adam, but as children of the new Adam, as children of Jesus. And so my prayer today, for each and every one of us, but in a very special way for our baptismal candidates, is that they would be filled with your Holy Spirit and that they would experience in their lives precisely what Peter and Paul speak of when they say that we are to be partakers of the divine nature. May they walk with you. May they be filled with you. May they know you so deeply that they become, or they experience rather, the promise of new creation, a new humanity. And we can't wait for the day, Lord, where you gather this new humanity into your kingdom to be part of a new world without pain and without suffering and without sin. Until then, may we keep our eyes on the promise. May we keep our faith in Jesus is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.